Hello, and welcome to our Friday webinar um, with Dr. Lamb. Welcome, Dr. Lamb. Hello. So we've got, let's see, not only oh, all top of the morning to everybody or top of the afternoon, because it's also St. Patrick's Day. That's why I've got my green on. And I see you've got, got your green on. <laughs> um, so we've got a really special webinar. We're going to be talking about parrot home hormones, um, like the top 10, right? Um, but it's also, not only is it St. Patrick's Day, but it is a special day for your little friend Arroyo there, who's also decked out in green. Just, you know, <laughs> no one's pinching Arroyo today. <laughs> he's, nope. he's all set. Um, so uh, we mentioned this in our last webinar that we're doing a surprise um, birthday, hatch day for Arroyo today. Um, so we have some presents for him to open since. <laughs> yeah, it's your surprise. So, for I think. Um, okay. So are we, he doesn't know anything about this. He's, he doesn't know anything about in. this. He had no idea that this was planned for him today. So he's pretty excited because LaFavors was super nice and sent a nice gift basket for him. So I'm going to, I'm going to get it. It's over here. It's, he has not been able to see it. Okay. And I, I'm going to ask everyone who's joining us right now, um, if you can, it's all just either just all of us sing a really quick happy birthday happy hat let's see, do happy. yeah i guess we'll do the traditional happy birthday right ready on three just or in your head if you're in public and you can't sing out loud um one two three happy birthday to you happy birthday to you happy birthday arroyo happy birthday to you i can't believe i just sang on this that's embarrassing i okay anyways all right i can't sing either <laughs> all right so he got this really awesome basket, and uh, not only was it filled with great stuff, but somebody went th through all the work of getting it all together so nicely. All right, so I think <laughs> the biggest thing in here, he's got lots of AVK and he's covered fellas, which is awesome. He is excited. But I'm looking at his body language, and he's already like, <laughs> he got somebody made him a cake above Nutriberries. So I'm going to open it up. Wow. A, a, a custom cake. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yep. He even got a happy birthday candle. He's, he knows it's, it's a birthday. He knows it's his, his hatch day. He's all like, yeah. <laughs> here we go. All right, Arroyo, come back. You got to come up here. So here is the super fun looking so you guys can see it first. Nutriberry cake. Wow. <laughs> so it's a whole bunch of Nutriberries together. And he's got his little candle for the top of it that says happy birthday. So you guys That's can awesome. see. That looks really yummy, actually. Um <laughs> thinking about it. This is the first time seeing it. Sometimes he's afraid of things, like if something new. And the candle might be a little intimidating. So I'm going to take the candle away, although he super appreciates it and I super appreciate it. We'll see if he'll take any. Wow. What do you think? How about this one? Mmm, there's even little cranberries on the top. <laughs> they put extra uh, topping of cranberries on. That's all. <laughs> yeah, it looks like there's some uh, dried bananas too. Wait, so so let's uh so we're celebrating his ninth hatch day, right? It's his ninth hatch day. Is that a little scary? He's, so I'm kind of glad I, I wanted to wait and see what he would do uh, with everybody here because he's always a little shy of things the first time he sees them. And I think it's good for people to see that because he is he explores a lot. He's an active bird. He enjoys lots of different things. He definitely is a foodie. But oftentimes the first time you see something, he's afraid of it. And, and it's good for people to know that um, birds are sometimes phobic initially. So if they see something for the first time and they act like they're scared, just give them time. Let them have a chance to explore things. Don't say, oh, my God, they looked at it once and it was terrifying and they never wanted to try it ever again. So um, he, he did what I wanted him to. <laughs> so that's an excellent point. The rest like, of he it. doesn't like this uh, toy or this food. And he's got yeah. Yeah, I, I, I hear that a lot with, with um, owners sometimes coming in saying like, oh, well, I tried it once and they really didn't like it. And then I ask, well, how long of a chance did you give it with the bird, you know? Um, and they may say, well, I only set it down for a moment. He acted terrified and I just 
put it away. Um, which of course we don't want birds to be terrified of anything. So maybe it needs to move to like a further location where they can see it from afar, but phobia of new things is not uncommon. Give them time and, and they'll get used to it. So he's uh, enjoying that nutriberry there. <laughs> oh, okay. And then, um, so if you could uh, just show us that fabulous basket he got, just because I, I... Yeah, yeah. Let me show you the basket he's uh, unwrapping to... Yes, so the other goodie that he got today um, is he got his just regular uh, pellets, just regular um, premium daily diet, plus these ones, which he's really going to love because he really likes the gourmet pellets because he's a fancy bird. Uh, he's gourmet. Yeah, so he likes the gourmet ones. I do think because it has the mango papaya and the pineapple, that's what really kind of has sold him on it. Um, and then he also got uh, some fruit delight Ava cakes, which he will certainly enjoy. And then just the regular classic Ava cakes, which honestly, he really does like the classic Ava cakes just fine. Um, and in fact, I, and he might actually like the regular classics better than he likes the fruit ones. I'm not too sure. We'll see. Um, yeah. But that's what I feel like I remember in the past with him, the things that we've, we've had previously. Yeah. I mean, I just can imagine you leaving the, the his 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 cake in the in the in the background there, and him just helping himself to right, slice. Yeah, himself, so I don't speak. know. He always is up to something during our little webinar, right? So who knows if he's going to uh, be getting into that? But if all right, too but, much, I'll be close enough to like close it off <laughs> if need be, <laughs> because that cake's going to last him for a little bit. He'll have to share it with his uh, friends tonight uh, at home. Says he has other birdie friends, of course. Yes, or he's going to make them all jealous. He's like, hey, I got this. <laughs> all right. Wow. That's a, well, again, happy Hatch Day, Arroyo. We're so glad that you are um, on these webinars with us, too. It's um, it's pretty spectacular. It has has our own little, uh, he's he, he's the product tester, and he's also uh, just the, uh, just watches in the background. I love it so much. Um <laughs> All right. So Dr. Lynn, we got a, we, we've got a, it's just this time of year, right? Perfect timing to, to discuss this topic. So um, are we doing a screen share today? On, yeah. Yeah. I've got uh, a um, PowerPoint that we can uh, go through. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Right. Oh, I got a PowerPoint. Oh, mm. here we go. Okay. So um, yes, it's kind of opportune time right now to be talking about hormone uh, issues because it really is breeding season. And um, it's something that, you know, even though it's breeding season, there are hormone issues that we'll see like throughout the year, um, just because in the wild, there's lots of stimuli that tell a bird it's time to be hormonal. And we've talked about that before in some previous webinars where we've gone over all those different, you know, environmental cues. And if anybody's interested, I know those are up um, and they can refer back to them. But we talked about things like daylight and humidity and um, foods and all that sort of stuff that can really stimulate a bird to know when it's time to be hormonal um, versus when they're in captivity. And we try to create this like perfect environment where um, our birds are, you know, hopefully really happy and thriving. Um, sometimes we maybe make things a little too perfect for them and they feel like, hey, they've got everything in the world. So they're just going to be hormonal all the time. So absolutely hormones can happen throughout the entire year. Um, but they tend to be seen most commonly in the, the spring time or sort of end of winter, beginning of spring. Um, so today's topic about hormones, since we've talked about hormones a few times now, taking it from sort of a different angle, uh, what are the most common hormone issues that I see? So um, this is going to be a top 10 countdown. Now it's going to be from the most common to the least common as opposed to the opposite. Um, so you know, of course, this is not an all encompassing. These are the only hormone related things we see. It's just these are the most common that walk into the practice where I work. And, you know, um, it could be different in other parts of the world. Some people may see certain things more so than I do. But but this is sort of my list of what's most common. All right. So uh, 
today is mostly just going to be pictures on our webinar here. The This picture is a picture of a bird getting an x-ray who was egg bound. Um, so egg binding comes in at number one, the most common thing um, that I am seeing in my practice uh, where I work um, currently and where I've worked in, in previous practices too uh, with hormone related problems in our pet birds is egg binding issues. So just to orient everybody to an x-ray if people aren't used to getting to see x-rays so much. Uh, this is actually an African gray and she's uh, laying on her side. Her head is over here. You can see her cute little beak. Um, her wings are kind of pulled up and then her feet are sort of back here. And you can see this nice bright ovally shaped thing that's in her abdomen. And what that is, is it is an egg that's in the back of her abdomen there. Um, and it's actually positioned normally. You can kind of see the tapered end of the egg because if you look at an egg and, you know, think about an egg that's sitting in your um, refrigerator that you got from the grocery store from a chicken egg, there's like a tapered end and then a more flat end. So here's that like more wider flat end and there's a tapered end. And the tapered end should be the portion that's like coming out first. Um, so this egg, when I look at it on an x-ray, I can say, well, it's oriented appropriately um, so that it is able hopefully to, to pass out okay. Um, but there's lots of different reasons that egg binding happens. There's, there's so many different underlying reasons for it that there's not just like like one thing where, oh, a bird comes in, it's egg bound, and here's the only reason why it occurs. There's tons of different things that can make it happen. And just to kind of list some of those things, egg binding can happen associated with first time laying. If a bird has never laid an egg before, sometimes that first egg that they ever lay is like really tough on them. Um, and so sometimes it's just as simple as that, just the first time laying. The other thing that's very common that we see uh, causing egg binding is when they've a laid too much. Um, so like opposite extremes. And the reason laying too much can cause them to get egg bound is because, you know, when you look at this x-ray, the reason that that you can see this egg is because it's a shell is around that egg, right? And what is that shell composed of? It's composed of calcium. And they need to take calcium from both their gastrointestinal tract that they've absorbed from the diet, but also from bony stores. And if they're laying a ton of eggs, like egg after egg after egg, then what can happen is they kind of deplete their own calcium stores. Um, and they don't have as much calcium as they need to maybe pass that egg out. Now, two things can happen when they don't have enough calcium that'll cause egg binding. One is you need appropriate calcium to have normal muscular contractions to the uterus to pass that egg out of the uterus. Um, and if they don't have enough calcium left to have normal muscular contractions, then they're just not gonna pass it out like they should. Um, so there's that. Um, and then the other thing is sometimes if you don't have enough calcium, well, then you don't calcify the egg as well as you're supposed to. And if you don't calcify the egg as well as you're supposed to, um, then what happens is that egg is now sort of soft shelled. And with it being soft shelled, it may not be able to push out as easily. That firm shell does help kind of with those muscular contractions, pushing it against that firm shell, gets that egg out easily. Um, but when it is soft shell, it's kind of harder to push that out. It may like the muscular contractions may sort of uh, potentially like deform around the egg as, and it's not getting pushed as easily. Um, so other reasons that you can have a bird get egg bound, um, if they're uh, dehydrated, vitamin A deficiencies can cause it. Um, it can also happen if there's something in the way, like if there's something in the cloaca that might be, you know, some sort of mass effect, um, or if there is uh, something like um, an other egg. So there have been times where birds pass two eggs and they're really only supposed to be passing um, you know, one at a time, but if like one went through and then it got stuck because of one of those other underlying reasons, and then they try to pass another egg, um, then they could potentially, um, you know, have two stuck in there and, and it's because something's blocking. Now, Arroyo is starting to be a little bit adventurous here, as I'm sure you guys can see, he's trying to get everything in the bag, which I'll let him get one of the Ava cakes if he decides it, maybe a little bit more of his, uh, a little bit more of his cake if he wants it, but I don't know how well you guys can see. Maybe I can angle down a little bit. There you go. That way you can that way you can see what our little mischievous guy is is doing here. Oh he yes, can, can totally see that. Seems yeah. to be enjoying that cake really well. So whoever it was at the favors that made this cake for him, um, 
I, you can see that he is satisfied. <laughs> Um, but all right, so egg binding, really common thing that we see, probably the most common of the hormone related problems that I see coming in. Um, okay, next thing, sorry for it being a little bit of a gross picture, um, but this is a picture of a cloacal prolapse. I know it's a little icky of a picture, but it's an important picture to see and understand because. Um, a cloacal prolapse, you know, what is it? We've talked about it previously in other webinars, but the cloaca is the common excretory organ where basically the gastrointestinal tract, the reproductive tract, and the kidneys um, sort of all dump everything into. And um, poop accumulates there, egg accumulates there, or, or other reproductive uh, matter, um, and then also urine, urates accumulate in that cloaca. For a variety of different reasons, sometimes that cloaca, when they're feeling really hormonal, um, they can push it out, whether that's because they are doing masturbating-like behaviors, because they're trying to pass an egg, maybe because they've passed lots of eggs and they're not passing another egg, but they've stretched that vent so much that maybe they're pushing for some other reason and then the cloacal prolapse happens. There are non-hormonal reasons why um, a prolapse can occur. Uh, you can see it associated with like infections in the cloaca, you can see it associated with um, papillomas or cancerous masses as well. But by and far, the most common reason we see cloacal prolapses is because of hormone related issues. Um, and with, with it being hormone related, um, what you'll end up seeing is just this mass of tissue, this big pink blob of tissue that has prolapsed out of the, the cloaca there. Um, and although Roy is doing a fabulous job of foraging, I'm going to help him just a little bit so he doesn't make too much of a mess here. There you go, buddy. There you go. <laughs> um, so actually, he did choose the the uh, fruit delight ones. I thought he I thought he liked the regular ones better, but he's going for the fruit delight right now. Um, anyways, so back to our clinical prolapse. Um, this is a really common problem that we see coming a bird coming in for. Now, when I see a bird coming in for a clinical prolapse, um, there's two things that I have to do. One, I have to figure out why it happened. Two, I have to get that prolapse back in. Now, in figuring out why it happened, again, the majority of these cases are because of hormone-related issues. Um, so I need to talk to owners about, has this bird been doing a lot of masturbating behaviors? Um, has this bird been laying a lot of eggs? Um, you know, have they been trying to regurgitate to the owner or searching out for cavities, you know, to do um, nesting in? Um, I may be needing to take an x-ray of a bird that has a cloacal prolapse if the abdomen feels really big. Uh, because again, sometimes these cloacal prolapses happen secondary to a bird trying to pass an egg. And even when I think I can feel an egg okay in the abdomen, it's still good to take x-rays because is it just one egg or is it two eggs? And oftentimes you can only feel, even when there are two eggs, oftentimes you can only feel one because one's higher up. Um, so x-rays are often needed in these cases um, as one of our diagnostics that we have to do. Sometimes we need to do other things as well, depending upon if it turns out that it's a case that's not for hormone related reasons, then we might need to be doing other sort of testing. So it's just important for owners to know that um, usually these cases, when they come in, they do require some level of testing that needs to be done to determine what um, is causing the, the prolapse to occur. And then, like I said, the second thing we need to do is we need to reduce that prolapse. So you can see what I have in this picture here. These are little, what's called cotton tip applicators. Uh, so they're basically like Q-tips, um, but they're, you know, uh, little longer ones. Um, and what we end up doing is we actually use those cotton tipped applicators to push that uh, prolapse back into the vent um, so that we have that tissue that is not supposed to be being out and exposed to the world back in where it's supposed to be. And then we usually have to put some sutures in um, to keep it in place, reduce the inflammation, get them on some anti-inflammatories. Um, but if this bird had an egg in there, then, well, I can't push that back in right away. I need to get that egg out first, and then I can push that cloacal prolapse back in. And a lot of the cases where they had the cloacal prolapse happen associated with egg binding, um, 
once you get that egg out of there, the tissue often wants to go back in very easily. But if that egg's still in there, it doesn't go back in easily at all. So um, it's important for people to recognize if they have this as a problem, more workup is needed. And um, we can't just pop the prolapse back in and everything's fine. In some cases, um, some of them do have to have other stuff done. Okay. Number three, most common thing that I see birds come in for that is hormone related is what's called ascites. Ascites is fluid that's building up on the abdomen. Um, and this little bird, uh, she's under anesthesia, just like the previous image. The previous image was a, a little budgie that was under anesthesia. They have a little face mask on um, and something that's, these face masks are kind of big and so they can be kind of big and open. So we have to sort of plug up uh, to keep their head in there so that they're getting the anesthesia and oxygen appropriately. Um, so so once they're appropriately under anesthesia, this little one is laying on her back here and you can see how she has this like belly that is protruding. That is very abnormal for a bird. A, a bird does not have a convex abdomen. They don't have a pot belly. They are not a mammal. Um, birds have concave abdomens. That abdomen should be sort of concave in, the skin should be really tight there, almost like skin, like a, a head of a drum, how you have like the material on the head of the drum, like really stretched out on the top of the drum and it's really tight. It's kind of how a bird abdomen is. It's the skin over there is really, really tight. Um, and it should be slightly concave. But since this is convex, this tells me there's something wrong with this bird. Now I have to feel it and see, does it feel like fluid? I may have to do some diagnostics like um, an ultrasound to identify if that is fluid that's in the belly of that bird. Um, you can see in this next picture here, we're actually putting a little needle into the abdomen. And again, you can still see how um, convex that abdomen abdomen is. And you can see when I'm getting into the syringe, that's all fluid that's pulling into that syringe there. So uh, that's very abnormal. Birds should not have fluid on their belly. So um, when I have a bird that comes in with fluid on its belly, it doesn't mean for certain that it's reproductive. It's just in birds like I don't know if anybody's done a study to say the exact percentages of time that it's reproductive related that fluid will build up, but I would say like I feel like it's 80% or maybe even more of the time that a bird comes in for fluid on its abdomen. It's because of some hormone or reproductive related problem, pathology that's going on. You can see fluid build up on the abdomen associated with liver problems. You can also see it associated with um, cardiac disease, um, and you can sometimes see it associated with cancers too, but by and far, most of these cases are, are reproductive tract and origin that's causing this fluid to build up. And there's so many different reproductive tract problems that can happen that can make this occur. Um, this can happen a lot of times people say, okay, when there's fluid on the abdomen, it happens because of something called egg yolk peritonitis. Um, and egg yolk peritonitis is only one of the reproductive tract pathologies that can cause fluid to build up. And I have to say, when it's egg yolk peritonitis, I'm kind of happy because those are sometimes easier cases to deal with. Um, but there's so many other reasons that you can get this fluid to de develop with reproductive causes. I've had it happen associated with like cystic ovarian disease. I've had it happen associated with impactions in the oviduct. So like basically there's something that's blocking um, passage of any sort of uh, egg-like material out of the reproductive tract. And then um, they can ovulate into the abdomen associated with that. I've had it and then get fluid buildup associated with it. I have had um, it happen associated with cancers of the reproductive tract. I've had it happen um, associated with infections. I've personally never seen a reproductive tract torsion in my career, but I've heard that that's um, something that other people have experienced is a torsion of the reproductive tract that then causes fluid to develop. So um, if a bird comes into the hospital with fluid on its belly, Though 80% of the time, and again, in my opinion, um, no studies to confirm that, but because it's so commonly reproductive in origin, but there's so many different causes, these birds absolutely need a lot more diagnostic workup. Like these are birds that do need to have things like blood work to look for other problems like liver problems. They need x-rays sometimes to look at the heart. They need ultrasounds sometimes to look at the reproductive tract or see evaluate the heart and the liver and those sort of things. Um, and then some of these birds 
um, the way we treat them, we have to draw the fluid off the belly because when you have fluid on your belly and you're a bird, it's not very comfortable. It's difficult to breathe. And so these birds have to have that fluid drained off, uh, which is what we're doing in the second picture there. But sometimes that fluid is going to be a reoccurring problem until we figure out the underlying reason for why it occurred in the first place. Um, and so it, it, it does require a bit of investigative work to figure out what is going on in these cases. So this is a most common reproductive problem number three. <laughs> All right, now on to most common reproductive problem number four. This is egg yolk peritonitis or egg yolk coelomitis, uh, depending upon semantics. Um, now, this is not a picture of egg yolk coelomitis in a pet parrot. So I just, you know, that disclaimer, this is not a pet parrot. This is actually a duck. And if you look at the picture here, this bird is under anesthesia and it's draped uh, surgically. Um, and there's this little cute little duck foot. Um, so, but this bird had a whole bunch of yolks that were free in the abdomen and they were starting to kind of congeal together. And so this actually looks like one, two, three, four different yolks um, that have ovulated into the abdomen, the location where they are not supposed to, um, and then sort of congealed together over time. And that caused a lot of problems in this bird. Now, sometimes egg yolk peritonitis or egg yolk coelomitis will cause fluid buildup like we saw in the last slide, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, in fact, in some species of birds, um, they can do this a lot and actually kind of do okay. And the species I'm talking about is chickens. Chickens actually do this quite frequently um, and can be totally fine, which is really amazing because sometimes when they have one uh, abnormal ovulation where they ovulate into the Saloma cavity of a parrot, parrots can be really, really sick from that. So there is some species variability of ability to handle some of these sort of problems. Now, these cases um, often need to be treated surgically because all that yolk that's free in the, in the abdomen or salomic cavity there can cause a lot of inflammation, be quite irritating. Um, and some of these birds need to actually be spayed. Now, when we spay a bird, it's a little bit different than when we spay a mammal like a dog or a cat that people are a lot, oftentimes much more um, uh, versed with that they understand a little bit more. When we're spaying a dog or a cat, we remove the ovary. We also remove like the entire um, uh, fallopian tubes, uterine body, um, that sort of thing. In birds, we just remove the oviduct. Um, we do not remove the ovary in, in birds. And that's because of there being some really important blood vessels that are kind of sandwiched just right underneath the um, ovary. And so in removing that, you could, you have a very, very, very high chance of damaging the vessels underneath there. And so at this point in time, when we spay a bird, Ovaries usually stay behind, but the oviduct is what comes out. And really, it's the oviduct that really makes all the different layers of the egg. Um, I know we've talked about it in previous webinars, but just again, as sort of a brief overview, uh, the on the ovary, that is where the yolk comes from. That's the follicle. Um, that follicle or yolk pops off the ovary. It then goes and gets engulfed by the oviduct. It moves down the oviduct and it gets the different layers of the egg put on it. So it gets the albumin layers and then it gets like some shell membranes and then it gets the shell put on top of it. Um, all that assembly of the egg around the yolk all happens in that oviduct. So when we take that oviduct away, they physically can't form an egg anymore, but they still have um, a ovary um, and they still have the ability to make follicles. What's supposed to happen when we spay them is it's supposed to send signals. Uh, there's supposed to be like hormonal feedback that happens between the oviduct and the ovary that we believe is supposed to stop the ovary from being um, able to become large, get follicles on it and ovulate. That's what we think, but the reality is um, that not all birds read the book that humans wrote. Um, and uh, sometimes birds do their own things and sometimes they will still ovulate after the fact. Um, and so there is the potential that even after being spayed, they can still get these egg yolk peritonitis or egg yolk coelomitis. Um, thankfully it doesn't happen in many birds. And in fact, I would say, um, 
I see it more commonly as a problem in after we've spayed ducks and chickens than I do in parrots. Um, the parrots tend to not do it as much, but there's the potential that they could do it. And then those birds sometimes need to be managed with hormones if they decide to still be ovulating uh, post being spayed. All right, so on to number five. Now this is a picture of blood work um, because I didn't have a good picture of a bird with this problem, but number five most common thing that I see birds coming in for that have reproductive uh, reasons behind them is hyperlipidemia. So what is hyperlipidemia? Hyperlipidemia is high fat levels. This is an example of one of my patients um, who has very high fat levels. And when you're looking at these, this blood work here, this is something that I look at all the time, you can see the different parameters of what we're looking at on blood work, the results for the patient, and then they give us a reference range. And anything that's out of the reference range is that this lab has highlighted for us nicely in red, just kind of to be like a, hey, pay attention to this. However, one thing you will notice is they don't give us a reference range for the triglycerides. We don't have a nice little box here to give us a reference range. And you know, different labs do different things, but this lab just doesn't give a reference range for triglycerides. But when I actually look at her triglycerides level, her triglycerides level is 1,841. That is very, very high. Normally, we want our triglycerides to go up to maybe like 170 is kind of okay. Some references will say it can go a little higher than that, but this bird is over 10 times its triglyceride level that it should be. This bird has very, 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 very high fat levels. And a lot of times that's hormone related, not always. Absolutely, there are other reasons why you can have high triglyceride levels. But this problem that the lab doesn't even like highlight and read for me, so it's like I could miss it if I wasn't actually reading the results, but a veterinarian really should be reading every single um, result that's on here to catch these sort of things. Um, this bird, when we did some hormone testing that's supposed to suppress the reproductive tract, uh, we then rechecked the triglyceride levels and those values were substantially improved. And if those values are substantially improved, after having got um, an injection of hormones that suppress a reproductive drive and reproductive hormones, um, that tells us that that fat level was up because of reproductive causes. And now I have to talk with the owner about, well, what can we do to make it so this bird doesn't act hormonal in the long run? Um, and again, that goes back to different environmental cues that we might be um, adjusting or maybe some dietary things that we're going to be working on, combination of the both, um, things to get their mind directed towards more appropriate things like foraging activities, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, it, it's a problem. Um, amazingly, if this was a mammal that had a triglycerides this high, I mean, honestly, if, we, if it was a human, uh, my human medical friends have told me somebody would have had a stroke at this level. Um, so this is something that birds are way more amazing than we are at being able to get really, really high and act like everything's fine. But the reality is they are at risk of problems when you have triglycerides that high. You could have something like a stroke. You could have something like, um, and birds we often, when it's hormone related, call it a yolk stroke. And I'm actually going to get into that one next. Um, but you could have things like liver problems. This predisposes birds to cardiovascular disorders as well if they persistently have this high fat level over time. <clears throat> so it's really important that we focus on trying to get this down. Um, and that's oftentimes by controlling hormones to, to um, a large degree. Um, the other things on here, just for fun, because I'm sure anybody who's watching this webinar is like, well, what about those other things that are out of the ordinary? I'll just tell you. Uh, the calcium and phosphorus level, you can see that they're quite high. This calcium level, again, if this was a mammal, having a calcium like three times the upper limit of what it should be would be very, very concerning. But birds, when they're hormonal, often have a spike in their calcium. So this is actually quite normal for a bird when they're hormonal, that they have their calcium up in like the 20s or even low 30s. And so I'm not um, worried by the calcium being that high because birds don't seem to have as much of a problem when it's just this intermittent increase in their calcium. Uh, the phosphorus goes up as well. It's just further uh, evidence for me to say like, okay, if your fat level is this high and your calcium and your phosphorus are this high, this is all hormone related. Um, and 
it's fine if it's a momentary thing that's going to just happen for a short period, but if it's something that is going to be a um, bird staying hormonal for months and months and months, okay, then we really got a problem. And again, high fat like this could predispose us to cardiovascular disease, which are unfortunately seeing more and more in our pet birds. Um, so we really want to focus on resolving that. So um, I know that it may not be as exciting with photos, but it is a really common thing that I see as a veterinarian. So it's important for owners to, to know about. Okay, now here's the next picture though. Um, this is an example of a bird that had um, an a yolk stroke. So this is what can happen in cases where a bird has gotten, um, had high fat levels for way too long. Um, and when your fat levels are really high and fat is circulating around in the blood vessels in the vascular system, if you've got a lot of it, it can kind of lead to like a little uh, embolus. Um, and depending upon where it decides to embolize can determine what sort of problems you have downstream from that. Because an embolus is basically sort of like a blockage in blood flow somewhere. And so if you're blocking somewhere where they're getting blood flow and there is uh, or is not a good collateral blood flow, then maybe, well, if you've got a blockage to that area, you're not getting good blood flow to that spot and you could have cells that die. And if that happens in a portion of the nervous system, then you could potentially have something like this happen where you get this head tilt um, that occurs this bird was also being uh, picked on by a mate. Um, thus, why it's got kind of sort of a little more shabby looking feathers. Um, but that's just, it was, its mate was, was doing that to the bird. Um, so this is something when they have egg yolk strokes, they can have head tilts. Sometimes they have um, hind limb paresis problems. Uh, but this is something that comes in with, with some frequency. Um, Thankfully, it's sort of later on in the list here. Uh, this is at what number are we? I believe we are at uh, number six with this one. Um, so, but it does happen. And, and, and birds will recover from these sort of things, but it does take um, some time and some supportive care. Um, and I've had some birds that have had some permanent neurologic deficits uh, after something like this happens. Okay, so on to number seven uh, is sort of another manifestation of that similar problem, but slightly different because this is a bird that has hind limb paresis. So this bird comes into the office and it can't walk. And I don't know why it can't walk. Now this can happen with an egg yolk stroke problem um, because if you have a bird that was, um, again, having those high fat levels for a period of time and it got a fat embolism in a vessel that's going to the hind limbs, then you may have them have hind limb paresis or paralysis problems. It could affect one leg, it could affect both legs. In this bird's case, it affected both legs, unfortunately. Um, so, but that's not the only reason that this can happen. You can have hind limb paresis problems happen for a variety of other reasons. The other hormone related reason that you will get hind limb paresis occurring is because of if you have a really large reproductive tract, um, like your males, because I know we haven't spoken too much about the males yet. Um, if you have a male bird who is having a very large testicle because they're feeling quite hormonal, that testicle where it's located up in the abdomen, it's kind of sitting right next to the kidneys. And then right underneath the kidneys is some nerves that are coming out from the spine here that go out to feed those hind limbs. And if you have a really large testicle um, that can put pressure on the kidneys, that then puts pressure on that nerve that's coming out, it's the ischiatic nerve um, that's coming out, it puts pressure on the nerves of those hind limbs, and then they can't walk very well, or they have weakness with one or both limbs, depending upon if you have uh, how things are being compressed. So when a bird like this comes in, absolutely, I need to be doing some x-rays, uh, potentially even doing an ultrasound um, to see what's going on, why could this be happening. Now, I usually do x-rays first with these birds because, hey, the other thing that could be going on with a bird that's not using either of its hind limbs, aside from you know a stroke-related uh, issue, aside from a um, large testicle or large reproductive tract, uh, if this was a female, a big egg could potentially do something like this, um, is these legs could be broken. You know, we, we could potentially have a bird that has fractures. Um, 
which thinking about it, I did not put this into the top 10. And I actually, I should have put this one into the top 10 is, is fractures. We do see a lot of birds coming in with hormone uh, induced causes of, of fractures. And what I mean by that is when a bird's really hormonal, particularly our females, um, and they're laying a lot and they are producing a lot of eggs, that means they're pulling a lot of calcium from bone stores. They may not have as much calcium reserves in those bone stores. Those bones may be weaker. And if a bird jumps off of something and lands funny, um, where they normally maybe not may not hurt themselves because they have strong bones. If they have very weak bones uh, because they're calcium depleted, then they absolutely could fracture them. Um, so that's another thing to, to consider when I have a bird coming in like this. Um, and again, it goes back to it being hormonal in some of these cases, you know. Um, of course, not all fractures are caused by hormone-related issues. It's just that um, I have to keep that on my mind. If I have a bird come in with like multiple fractures, I have to ask the owner, Hey, you know, is your bird really hormonal right now? What's this laying like, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, because we need to determine if we need to also be dealing with a hormone related, uh, drive that's going on. That's making those bones weak and, and brittle. So, um, okay. Now we're going to move on to the next few. Um, this is number uh, eight. Now I put this in at number eight because um, I'm going to get into more of the behavioral issues associated with lots of hormonal drive. And I have to say, in, in reality, I probably need to shift this one. Like if I'm, if I'm truly looking at what are the most common from common uh, causes for birds coming in with hormone related problems to the office. This probably shifts up a little higher. It's just sometimes hard to truly prove that this is hormone related alone um, because this is these are both birds that have feather destructive behaviors. And as we talked about a tiny bit, I think in the last webinar we did when we were going over feathers, um, feather destructive problems are very common, number one, but there's so many different causes for them that they can be very, very complex. I shouldn't say they can be very complex. They are very complex um, because you can have a bird come in with feather destructive problems like this and they just, there's so many things that can cause it. And you really have to get inside the bird's mind to try to figure out what is making this particular bird be, do, be doing these behaviors and be acting this way. Um, and there is a subset of them that do it because of hormone drive. And there's a lot of controversy as to why hormonal drive stimulates them to do this behavior. And I, I really don't think we have it totally figured out at this time. Um, there are people who say, well, and I believe I, I spoke about this last time as well. Um, it can happen. They can do this feather destructive behavior relating to hormones because some species do pull feathers to make a brood patch, um, but it doesn't in their nest. So like basically they'll pull a few feathers uh, and line their um, nest with some of these feathers to make it like a little softer environment for those eggs to lay on and then those babies to hatch out onto. Um, but it doesn't seem like parrots do that so much. So uh, if, if they're not doing that behavior so much, um, the other purpose of a brood patch is it kind of allows for certain species, they have like a little bit more vasculature to the skin um, at an area where they pluck those feathers. And then it allows the skin to be in closer contact with the eggs. So it allows for like a little more warmth um, and, and incubating those eggs. But again, parents don't seem to really have that. So how much of it is picking because of a brood patch thing uh, hard, very hard to say. I don't, I don't know that that's the reason for it. Um, other people will say it's because of just the stress, you know, these birds are wanting to go through the behavior of having a family, essentially, we could say, um, you know, all the things that it entails for a wild bird, but they're not able to enact those normal behaviors that they would be in the wild. So if they're not able to do those normal behaviors, that can be stressful. And maybe that's what makes them pick on themselves. Um, you know, it, it's something that we, we haven't figured out the exact reason why they do it. There's many theories. Um, now there's absolutely things we can do about it. When we, when we have these birds come in and they have feather destructive behavior, again, I have to look at many different 
uh, things that could be causing this. I have to talk with the owners a lot. I have to listen to the history, um, you know, do my physical exam, see if I can find other underlying reasons, uh, potentially be doing some diagnostics. Um, but if I, if I am able to come to the conclusion that I think this is probably hormone related, then again, we gotta go back to, well, what do we do in these situations? We have to maybe adjust their environment to reduce hormonal cues, adjust their diets to make them feel less hormonal, um, adjust the way people are interacting with them, make the birds be, or encourage the birds to be redirecting their attention to more appropriate behaviors through foraging activities, trick training, interacting with birds in different ways that's more engaging with them as opposed to like cuddling with them. And even though it's fun to cuddle, you know, I'm not saying that you can't cuddle your bird. I'm just saying, be mindful if your bird is really hormonal and you're cuddling it, maybe we need to do something else. Maybe we need to do something that's more purposeful. Uh, let's get them foraging for things. Or again, let's start working on trick training because trick training is honestly a lot of fun and you can take your bird and like have, uh, you know, do tricks with your bird around friends and family and all that sort of stuff. Um, all right, all right. I'm going to take Arroyo's uh, cake away from him because he's done a pretty good job. I think he's had, I think he's had his share of the cake. I'll show you guys real quick. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, he's like really kind of destroyed this area over here. Took a few <laughs> nutrients out of the top there. So I think I will set it away for the moment because he has had a very good snack. Um, and, you know, in light of our talk about hormones right now, even though he's getting some nutritious stuff, you know, he doesn't need a large amount because portion control is really important when we're talking about um, helping our birds to not be so hormonal because when they have big proportions of things, um, that can be a sort of signal to them that, oh, I have all these resources available to me. Um, and that may be something that can be a little bit stimulating and driving. So um, he's doing a, a great job on the cake. He'll have some more to this evening. And uh, again, like I said, he can share it with his his friends this evening, but I think he's good for right now. <laughs> Um, so yes, that's, that's feather destructive behavior as one of the common problems and issues associated with, with hormones. All right. The next thing, screaming, um, this is absolutely something that happens. Um, and it can be hormone related again, not all screaming behavior is because of hormones. It's just something that I have a lot of owners that say when it's hormone season, it's a lot louder in their house. And I will say um, that I can attest to that as well. Sometimes it's a bit louder in my house during the hormone seasons than when it's like off hormone season. Um, so now it, it, as far as it being a problem, I would say it, it's something that it's not necessarily a problem in all homes. Uh, for some people, they don't mind if, if their cockatoo is screaming and and uh, being quite vocal and loud. Uh, for other people, it is a big problem, you know? So it's something that I, I put it as a problem, um, but <clears throat> I think it's very much situational dependent that it's not a problem necessarily for um, every case, um, every bird that comes in. Um, you know, uh, screaming is is very much situational dependent and dependent upon the home in, in which the bird is in as to whether or not it truly is a problem. But um, why can screaming be a uh, hormone associated behavior? Because, well, you know, part of it's contact calling in, in birds in the wild. Well, hold on a second. Come here. Getting into trouble because I took his cake away and he knows it's his birthday. So, you know, that was very unfair of me to take his cake away. Um, he's trying to destroy pens. We don't need him doing that. Uh, okay. So, anyways, the reason, you know, screaming happens is associated with hormones is because, again, it's this contact calling sort of thing. It's communication. Birds are communicating with each other in a variety of ways through vocalizations, through uh, feather uh, changes and things they do with their, the positioning of their feathers with their eyes, you know, um, various, various ways that we express ourselves, birds express themselves too, one of which is through getting quite loud at times. So um, again, we just have to go back to all the things we talked about previously of ways to reduce hormones to kind of dampen this behavior um, and, and not feed into it so, so much. Um, one thing I will say that I have encouraged people to do that I think is helpful is 
you know, contact calling is okay. It's normal. It's a behavior that parrots do. If they are in the wild, they are contact calling each other if they're out of sight of one another. And so for people who like walk out of the bedroom and or the room where their bird was in and the bird starts screaming for them, respond to those things that are a little bit more pleasant. For example, Arroyo, the way that he contact calls is he says hello, um, which is so much more pleasant hearing hello from another room than hearing, you know, a real like screechy call. I don't respond to the screeches. I respond to the hellos. So if he says hello, then I say hello back and maybe we go back and forth a little bit. And sometimes we even have a conversation of he says hello. I say hello back and then he says, come here. And I say, I'm, I can't come over there yet. I'll get you later. And then he'll say, step up, you know? So, but those are like this conversation that we have back and forth is so much more nice and pleasant um, to me. Um, and, you know, probably anybody else around than hearing just screaming. And it's helping him too, because then he knows like, okay, we're just talking back and forth. Everything's okay. And it doesn't, I don't have to like, um, I guess maybe, uh, make him feel uncomfortable if he is by himself um, and nobody's responding to him when he's contact calling. So it, it can take a little bit of time because it does involve shaping the behaviors. Um, so it's it's not a like quick, easy fix. But if you have a problem with screaming with your birds, um, trying to shape it to something that you like better is, is good. All right. And then um, I put this as um, number 10 for common uh, hormone related problems, and this is biting. Um, so I didn't have a picture of a bird biting someone, which is a good thing. I'm glad I don't have a picture of a bird biting someone. Um, but, you know, absolutely bites can happen associated with hormones because, again, a variety of reasons. This is a behavior. When a bird bites somebody, they're trying to get some information across to that human being. Usually before a bite happens, a bird gives tons and tons of other signals to tell a person that it is going to bite. Um, usually they're doing things like pinning their eyes or putting their feathers a, per a certain way, or maybe hunkering down and like fluffing certain feathers up. Um, they uh, Or they may even be like looking away, leaning away. They may be doing tons of behaviors to tell a person don't come any closer. I'm not interested in interacting with you, but oftentimes we're not so um, receptive to those things, um, or we don't think to be receptive to them sometimes, and we kind of push birds to an extent to where then they bite. What? <laughs> yeah. just had a tumble. I don't know if anybody saw that, but he was playing in the basket and it just tumbled over, but upset the basket on the floor. Um, so the 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 gift has become also a fun foraging thing because this basket is definitely a nice fun wicker basket that he can chew up and have fun with. So, so many ways that he is having a great birthday today. <laughs> um, but anyways, so back to the, the last one of, of biting um, being a hormone related thing. The reason it happens associated with hormones is because oftentimes birds are doing protection of their environment or protection of a particular person, other bird or object that they think is either their mate or a resource to them. Um, you know, if a bird's in the wild and it's feeling hormonal, usually it's going to pair up with a single other individual. That bird and that other individual have to secure a um, nesting site and they need to protect that nesting site from other birds that may even be, you know, um, like friends or associates or, you know, birds that they are with in a flock frequently, but they need to protect it from those other individuals because those other individuals want to move in and use that same nest that they're in. And that's not okay. They need to keep that nesting area for themselves and they're going to be protected amongst, against everybody else. And if somebody does try to come in to that nest, um, then they may be a little bit uh, defensive of it and not just say, hey, come on in. They're going to say, hey, this is mine. You need to get out. Um, and so that's why biting behaviors often happen. Um, and, and it just takes us as their caretakers to read all the signals that they give beforehand to recognize that they may be feeling protective, again, of that resource, whether it be another person, an object, another bird, or the environment in which they are in. 
And we absolutely can work around these sort of problems by giving them um, uh, interacting with them to uh, maybe trick train them to be able to come out of an area and be in a place of not so much of a um, guarded resourced uh, environment or maybe again we work on all those things that reduce their hormones or maybe we take away nesting material so that they aren't using a nesting box or what have you or if there's a particular toy that they really like maybe they don't get that toy anymore those sort of things um, so there absolutely are ways to work around this biting behavior um, so but it, it does take a bit of time to read the behaviors, understand why they're happening, recognize that the bird is not evil. It is just doing what it is meant to do as a bird um, and then figure out ways to work around it. So those are my top 10. I think we have about five minutes left. Um, and, you know, are there any questions? I'd like to open it up for, for people to ask any questions that they would like to, to know. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen okay. at this point. So I, I, we have a lot of questions. I think we'll have to um... Let's see. Uh, we'll we'll post uh, the responses also if we don't get to them. Um, uh, let's see where we are. Oh, because I have to I have to do giveaways. Let me see if we have maybe time for one question. Um, you know, you're talking about the hormones, right? Uh, I wonder. You know, like with with humans, sometimes it can make you um, your tolerance level for things. When you, if you're you know have a lot of hormone, it might make you have your you know something annoys you that much quicker. I wonder. If it... I I absolutely think that probably does play a role in births. As well, um, I mean, I guess I, I don't have any uh, way to prove that other than maybe some of these like behavioral issues that we talked about. Um, but yes, I, I do think uh, hormones can play a, a role in our tolerance of things at times. Birds tolerance of things. All right. So a uh, question about uh, peach front conure. Uh, it's approximately in the late twenties um, adopted. Um, Annually, annually lays an egg or two, but this year it was multiple day ordeal and immediately after had urinary symptoms. Um, they're assessing her for possible acute or chronic renal problems. Um, the question is, can she be given anything uh, for the next year to stop the stress of egg laying or to stop it entirely? Well, I wish there was a, I mean, the only way to stop egg laying entirely is to truly spay them. And, but even then that comes with risks. So it's not like we don't, whenever I spay a bird, I'm talking to the owner about the potential for them because they still have that ovary that they could ovulate and have that egg yolk problem, blah, blah, blah. But that's the only way to really actually stop the formation of an egg. However, you can do hormone therapy to stop, um, or to hopefully stop, because it doesn't work in every single case. There's uh, two hormones that are often used. One is an injection called Lupron. There's another one that's an implant called Desilorelin. They're hormones that are like feeding to the brain and telling the pituitary system in the brain to like um, essentially tell the hormone system, the reproductive system to shut down because you're being way too hormonal is, is what those do. Um, but they're not permanent fixes. So they have variable lengths of time that they work for. The Lupron shorter, duration, the Desirelin's longer duration. Absolutely, we use them, um, but we have to think of them kind of as a Band-Aid, um, that they're not going to fix hormones forever and you're always going to have everything solved. They're, they don't work in every single case. They work for a finite period of time. The more you use them, it seems like the length of time that they work for seems to shorten somewhat. Um, and But they absolutely have their role. They are super helpful in many cases, uh, but you have to talk to your vet to see if that's something that might work for the individual. Okay, there you go. Um, well, we have a, if <laughs> the rest of the questions we'll, we'll have on Ask the Fever uh, next week uh, with the answer. So uh, for those who didn't get, uh, we didn't get to the questions, uh, we will have them up on Ask the Fever next week. Um, because yeah, that was a good uh, presentation. I have to announce our winners because we are, I'm sorry, we're going to give giveaways uh, uh, for nine lucky viewers um, in honor of, of a Royals Hatch Day. So so nine people we're going to give away. And also uh, the 50th 50th anniversary of uh, La Fever. Um, so we're going to give the classic, the, the diet that started it all. And that's the, pel the classic pellets. Um, that's going to go out to Okay, Alan Brown, congratulations. Gail Jordan, Ray uh, Domingo, um, Tabia uh, Goosen, Margaret uh, Steiner, Louisa um, Jaskluski, uh, Jill Lewis, James Hill, and Brandon Hunt. Sorry if I mispronounced any names, mispronounced any names, but those are our nine lucky giveaway winners. Um, and they will, let's see, also the Fieber, the, 
they're gonna be really busy at pet um at the conference so what's what's the one next week um so in, in, they'll they'll reach out to you um they may global pet sorry uh next week so the week after that they'll probably you'll probably have a reach out from the fever on where to where to send that to so congratulations on that um another update um uh dr tolly will not be with us next friday uh he has um he, you know he, he he's he's just like dr lamb they are working vets who are who are generous with their time uh you know dr lamb i, I believe it's like your lunch hour that you often spend with us so very appreciative of that and uh Likewise, Dr. Tolley will be meeting uh, with his students next week to review their uh, master thesis. So he's going to be busy uh, giving people, uh, upcoming up vets, their um, feedback on their on their thesis. And so, so then our next one will be on March Friday, March thirty first, with Dr. Uh, with Lisa Bono, and she's going to be talking about hormones specific um, to African greys. So uh, I guess African greys and hormones is a topic in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can go through all, each species though. They all have their little differences, right? Yep. Um, um, and then just to say thank you again, and Roy wants to show you the mess he made on the chair there, like all the little pieces of things and then on the floor. I don't know if you can see that, but he's uh, definitely like <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> crumbs all over the place. He absolutely enjoyed his cake. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. That's how you know it's a well received. Um, you know, it'd be it'd, it'd be a travesty if he was just sitting there and it was just like looking at it and not. Uh, but man, the way he, I, I'm just gonna imagine his his the rest of his day and through the weekend is just gonna be he's gonna be living it up. Yeah, yes, absolutely. He's stocked up for a little bit, I think. <laughs> I'm. Wow, that's he's like all relaxed, relaxed back there. He's like, yeah, it's my hatch day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. On that note. Dr. Lamb, thanks again for joining us. Arroyo, happy hatch day um, on behalf of everyone with us today. And um, until next time, all the best to you and your flock. Stay safe. And again, happy hatch day. Bye. Bye.